thank you for your word. We thank you for how great you are. I thank you, Lord, that we have this privilege of opening your word tonight. I ask you that you would come in your strength and might and power and accomplish what you would have to accomplish tonight, that you would encourage us, that you would lift up our hearts and our faith would rise in our walk with you, and, and that the enemy would be bowed under our feet, the enemy would be scattered, and that, Lord, that we would just go forth in victory in everything and, and everywhere we go by that precious blood that Jesus shed for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Acts chapter 7, uh, beginning in verse 35. Uh, this is the passage of Stephen. Uh, Stephen is um, giving his speech. Um, he's right on the verge of, of being killed. So this, in effect, is some of his last words. Uh, because after he gives this message, uh, they, they kill, they martyr Stephen, and Stephen becomes that first martyr for Jesus Christ. But he says in verse 35, This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out, after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses, this is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. And this is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spoke to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them and in their hearts turn back again into Egypt. And I wanted us to look at those words, the church in the wilderness tonight, and draw our, our subject from those words that Stephen uses. That term church... Uh, which is what we use today to refer to the body of Christ. But it, it means an assembly, uh, a gathering of people. So he says the church in the wilderness. And we know that from what Stephen is sharing here, from what Stephen is, is preaching, we understand that when it, God led Israel out of Egypt, that it was one of the most greatest uh, things that had ever happened. I mean, never, ever, ever before had God ever done what he did to a land like he did to Egypt. No plague had ever, God had never flexed his muscles like he did during that time to, 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 to set his people free. When you read the scriptures, when you read from the fall of man, I mean, there was God's provision. Uh, me and Lexi was reading just yesterday about Cain and Abel. And as wicked as Cain was, the very first murderer, like, and, and, and the scripture would speak of him being a, a persecutor against Abel because he knew Abel was more righteous than he. Yet God had mercy on him. He stuck a mark on him. So that nobody would kill him. And he said if anybody would kill, kill him, then, then in such a way they would have to die. So even in that, God's grace was upon Cain. But never before had God flexed his muscles like he did to let Israel free from Egypt. And here, all of these years later, Stephen is drawing from that testimony of how God brought and provided for Israel Jacob's seed in the, in the wilderness. And I want us to know two things today. You and I are in a wilderness right now. Now, I'm going to talk about this in a moment, a little later, but we know that we're pilgrims in this life. That everything we go through here is temporal. We better recognize that this is not our real home. And if we're setting up camp down here, this may be our best life. Because we can't do it. 
And I'm saying that off of a book that's popular right now in the Christian church that was written by a very popular man of living your best life now. And we as Christians are not called to do that. We as Christians are called to live a crucified life, to live a life of servanthood, of service to the Lord Jesus Christ, of recognizing that this is not my best life now. My best life is yet to come. And that's the life I'm living for. That's the hope that I have in my heart. So in that sense, and we're going to talk to you a little bit later, we understand that we are in a wilderness but a wilderness is a dry place. A wilderness is a place where there is not an abundance of life. A wilderness is a place that's hot during the day and it's cold at night. It's a place that it's, it's, you don't get comfortable. You're either too hot or you're too cold. Uh, there's, not, there's not shelter. There's, it's, a, it's a pretty miserable place to be in in the wilderness. And that's the type of that is used here for, for the Israelites, and that's where God allowed them to be. And the scripture says he allowed them to be there to test them. And you and I, if we're not in a bad wilderness right this moment, we will be. And you probably have been in one before. And so you know what it's like to be in a trial, a tribulation, to be in a wilderness where it's dry and it's thirsty and it just seems like you're crying out to God, but you have more questions than answers. You guys ever been there? Where you asked God why, and you asked him more questions, and you really knew what the answer was. And you, even King David, when he was writing his psalms, he would cry out to God and say, Lord, don't be silent. If you are silent unto me, I will perish. I will die. You've got to speak. And that's how... Our heart can be to the Lord as God. You've got to give me a word. You've got to give me a sign. You've got to give me something fresh. And I want to encourage you tonight. That camera is right in front of Rose's face. It's like a body in a camera. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but uh, uh, if you've ever been in that place where it's like you, you need a fresh word from God. Just like when you eat, you can't. If you ate yesterday, that isn't going to suffice you for today, is it? We, every day we need a nourishment. And that's how we have to be with God. And I want to encourage you to seek God every day for a fresh word, a fresh, uh, a fresh uh, message that God would give us. Because every day we've got to feed our spirit. Every day we've got to eat of the manna from heaven. And so that wilderness can be that dry place where it seems like, there's very little food, and you're hungry spiritually. You're, you're thirsty, but it's like it just never gets quenched. I've been in wildernesses like that, and they're never fun. They're, they can be the most driest, miserable places. But I want to encourage us that when we're there, it's a testing for our heart. It's a testing of will we cling to faith? even when there doesn't seem to be any other way. I want to take you, if you would, to uh, Psalms uh, 78. This is an incredible chapter that I have been encouraged by many, many times. Uh, Psalm 78. And the psalmist is speaking of the time that the Israelites were in the wilderness. And we're going to begin in uh, in verse 12 it says marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the field of Zoan it says he divided the sea he caused them to pass through he made the waters to stand as a heap I mean when God flexed his muscles at this time it was mind blowing to, to the, the ten plagues that God did upon Egypt, no one had ever saw such a thing before. I mean, Pharaoh was so puffed up with himself and pride, and kind of rightly so in the, in the sense of his mind, in that there was no God that had ever challenged him before. He truly believed that he was a God, and that there was no God greater than him. And yet all of a sudden he's coming face to face with the God that gives his 
breath, that gives him breath, that allows his heart to beat. And you see this, the pride of man and the beauty and power of God come together and they're colliding. And man just won't give up. Man just won't submit. He won't humble his heart. And God more and more and more is tightening that grip to prove just how big he is. And God told him, you let my people go. You need to let them go because they're mine. You have held them bound for too long. They're mine. You need to let them go. And all of these signs that God did from the serpents on his floor to the, to, the, to the Nile being turned to blood, to the plagues, the, 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 the darkness, the frogs, all of these things. And then it ending with the death of his firstborn son. It says there was not a house in all of Egypt that was not affected by the death of someone. And the cries went up from the earth. And they could hear them for miles and miles away because of the God flexing his power. And yet in all of this, Pharaoh's heart was still hard, and in all of this, Israel still just couldn't quite believe God. It says it in verse 14, In the daytime he led them with a cloud, and all the night with a light of fire. He clave the rocks in the wilderness, and he gave them drink as out of the great depths. And if you read Exodus, you'll see all of these things. That rock. They, they, they complained no no sooner than they were really even out of, 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 Egypt, of Egypt. They weren't out very long, and they complained that there was no water. And they said, you let us out here because there wasn't enough graves to bury us, so you're just going to bury us in the wilderness. And Moses cried out to God, and God said, take your staff and hit the rock. And he did, and a geyser come out of that rock, uh, enough of a... And, it wasn't just a drinking fountain. I mean, they had well over a million souls. And on top of that, they were loaded down with cattle and livestock. All of these things had to drink, and they got their fill. So you're talking a rock that produced a geyser in the wilderness to provide for them. They watched this. It says uh, in verse 16, he brought streams also out of the rock. He caused waters to run down like rivers. It says, and they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. And I want us to get this in our heart tonight, that when we're in the wilderness, when we're in that dry and thirsty place, when we are, are, are being tested on will we trust God, we better make sure that we don't cut God short. It says here, uh, in verse 18, I love this. They tempted God in their heart by asking uh, meat for their lust. Yea, they spoke against God and said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? I love it. Because the answer is yes, he can. Yes, God most certainly can furnish a table in the wilderness. You can you just see God. In the middle of a desert, they challenged God. Could God do this? And he says, Sure, I can. And he lays out the full the full course, right out there in the middle of nowhere, just to prove to them, I got a rock that can follow you, which the psalmist then said that that rock was Jesus Christ, a type of Jesus. I've got manna for you every single morning, fresh, and 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 I got quail for you in the evening. He says all of these things I will provide for you. I absolutely can provide you a table in the middle of the of your wilderness, and I want to encourage us. Well, if we're in a wilderness right now, if we're feeling like we're getting pinched in and how is things going to work out the way God, like I think they should or, or whatever. It could be family issues. It could be, I mean, I've been in dry times in my life spiritually to where you just didn't feel like getting up and reading your Bible. You didn't feel like getting on your knees and praying. I, mean, I would be a liar if I told you that I didn't. There's been so many times that I have gotten on my knees and to pray and all of a sudden I got so sleepy isn't that how it works yeah. or I got I got in, the, in, in, a, in my prayer time in a time to seek God and it was like everything it just it just didn't work as the words are coming out of my mouth doubt was biting them and catching them and it was like 
you felt like you were chasing your tail because you know God isn't going to answer your prayers unless you ask them in faith. And here you are asking them and you know you ain't believing because they're just words because you're in the back of your head. You're doubting everything you're saying. Is God really going to provide a table in the wilderness? Or is God really going to heal my body? Is God really going to touch my, my, my loved ones? And the whole time you're thinking, no, no, no. Uh, years ago, I told you this before that I was preaching somewhere. I don't even know where I was at or what I was preaching but I was preaching at this place, and an elderly woman come up afterwards, and she wanted prayer. And she said she had a horrible migraine. And I can feel for her. I've suffered from migraines since I was a kid. And they are debilitating. I mean, I would get them so bad that I would vomit. But I would want to vomit because it seemed like after I threw up, it, my, they would go away. And so it was, it was a, a horrible way to live. And that, that old, uh, elderly lady came up to the front of that, of that, I think I was in a hotel. I don't think, I think they had rented a hotel room or something. It wasn't a church. And um, she came up to the front and she wanted prayer. And I remember putting my hand on her head. And the whole time I'm thinking, are you really going to do this, Lord? Are you really going to heal this, this sweet little old lady? And the whole time I'm thinking that, I'm praying, God, I know you're going to heal her. Lord, I know that you're going to touch her and make her whole. And the whole time I'm thinking, no, this ain't going to work because it's, it's doubt is overriding my faith. Well, the woman, after I said amen, she said, praise God. It's gone. And I stood there and I thought, Lord, it wasn't my faith that healed this woman. It was her faith. She came up believing that her Jesus was going to touch her and heal her. And he did. And but, but I've been in those wildernesses where I would say, can God truly provide a table in the wilderness? Can he really do this? And, of course, the answer is always yes, he most certainly can. It says, behold, he smote the rock, verse 20. The waters gushed out. The streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he also provide flesh for the people? That's what they said. They, 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 they got filled with water, but then they said, but where's the food? I mean, inconsiderate, selfish, horrible people. We're just like them in a, in a lot of ways. And they said, can he also do this and that? Therefore, the Lord heard this, and he was wroth. So a fire kindled against Jacob, meaning against the seed of Jacob, and anger against Israel because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. You see, this is the purpose of our wildernesses, is to try us to see will we trust in God? Will we truly believe in him? And whether it's been the youth center, the youth center is celebrating its 25th year, which ironically, it's been a humdinger of a year to celebrate an anniversary. But 25 years, uh, the youth center uh, has been reaching kids in our community. But that didn't just happen overnight. I mean, I, the, the people that will call mom up on the phone and say, we'd like to start a youth center in our community. Uh, we want to come and see how you do it. Well, when they start to realize what all has happened, they don't really want that. They don't want to start small and, and get to that point. They don't want to do it for 25 years with no pay and have no paid staff. They have everybody be volunteer. They don't want these things because they have their own way. But see, God has a different way about things. And God it always requires us to, to, to have to make a sacrifice unto him. And this church, it, it didn't just happen. I mean, God has, has, has led us from being in a home church to hear and he's provided all along the way and I can't even tell you how many times I was crying out to God God are you really going to furnish a table in the wilderness are you really going to be able to see us through and every single time God has been so far more faithful than I have because God's really able to do it and when it comes right down to it are we willing to trust him are we willing to just let go and believe that God's able? And I think the, 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 the secret is making sure that you are where God wants you, that you're in the will of God. 
Because a lot of people are get outside of God's will, but yet they are still expecting God to do things. And God doesn't work that way. But when we know that we are in God's will, and that we, and if you're anything like me, you do it with fear and trembling because you're fearful of making a mistake. You're fearful of, I know if I get off track, then the curse of God comes upon me. It isn't going to be his favor. And I don't want to be under the curse of God. I want the favor and the blessings of God in my life. And I know you do too. So when we know that we are in God's will, that we are where God wants us, then at that point you just trust. And you watch to see where God brings the answer, what he does. Years ago, the youth center had been shut down. I'll stop and let you have any comments or questions. Or we had closed the door, rather, because um, we had electrical problems. Uh, praise God for volunteers who do work. But we had a volunteer, as precious as he was, he ran an extension cord to our electrical panel. I mean, completely not of code. And praise God, it worked. But we knew this cannot continue like this. And uh, we closed the youth center down so that we could renovate it. And we hired uh, a guy, an engineer to design it. And we put in a, a grant to a, a foundation that had always given us a massive amount of money. The youth center has never paid a single penny in interest. It has always paid all of its bills on time and in full. It's never been in debt. It's always paid. God's always provided like that. And uh, we thought, well, we just we just know God is going to give us this huge, I don't remember now how much it was, but it was a lot of money. Uh, God's going to give us this huge grant to do this. And I, I remember I was at Walmart and I was shopping. I didn't know Lane at the time. So this was before I was married or had kids or anything. And my phone rang, and it was like those big, huge cell phones that you pull out and have the antenna, you know. And I was like, hello. And it was mom. And she said, we just got in the mail a letter from the foundation, and we did not get the grant. And my heart just went, because I, I was so confident that this was how God was going to do it. That, of course, God is going to do it this way. And we began to enter into a wilderness where it was, God, will you ever open this youth center back up again? What is going to become of it? Is this, is this it? And crying out to the Lord, asking God, did we go wrong somewhere? What has happened? And I don't remember how many months, but the youth center was doors were closed because we couldn't reopen until we had the money to do the renovation and it just we had no place to turn there was nowhere to go and all of a sudden out of the blue uh, a factory in town they said we would like to give in kind to you we'd like to donate to you the the workers we're going to pay our workers to do work for you and at the same time there was another foundation that we asked, would you be willing to meet their in kind? So otherwise, if S it was SDI, by the way, if SDI would pay uh, a worker, an electrician, to do all the work, and it would cost SDI $10,000 to pay that electrician, would this other foundation be willing to match that in cash for in kind? And they said, absolutely. So for every dollar that SDI spent in paying an in-kind worker, this other foundation get, matched it with cash. And it was absolutely amazing to see how God just orchestrated all this together. And that's just, that's a miracle. I mean, you talk about, we think of feeding 5,000 with, with, you know, was it two fish and five loaves or five loaves and two fish? Uh this was just as much of a miracle to have God bring about this, this out of nowhere to furnish a table in a wilderness. And I got story after story after story after story just like that of where it just seemed like whether it was through this church or the, or the, uh, the youth center or in my own family's, my own family's life 
where it was like we were against the wall. How is this going to happen? And God was testing us to see whether we would believe, whether we would trust him. And if you're in a wilderness right now, if you're the church in the wilderness, God is able to make a way. He is able to furnish that table. Don't be like these Israelites who after they had drank their fill, then complained that they didn't have food or didn't have bread. And after they ate bread, they complained that they didn't have meat. And then they started to say, don't, don't you remember back in Egypt when we were feasting on all the delicate food? And they were slaves. I mean, I don't know any slave that really ate well. And they're saying, remember the leeks and the garlics and the onions and all of the herbs that we got to eat? Don't, you, don't we miss all of these things? And God's wrath was kindled against them again. Because here God is furnishing this table for them. And they still found space to, 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 to complain. The fact is, the Bible would tell us that God told them. He goes, I'm going to give you quail. And he says, you're going to eat quail until it comes out your nose. <laughs> Literally, that's what he told them. He goes, you're going to eat quail. I'm going to stuff it down your face until you're so sick of it that you cannot stand it any longer. That's exactly what God did when they were complaining about the manna, which is called angel's food. In verse 25, it says, man did eat angel's food. He sent them meat to the full till they were full of food. And yet, then they said, but this is just light bread. This isn't meat. So God says, I'm going to give you quail every night and you're going to eat it till you hate it because of how you've acted towards me. But I, I, I want to bring this out. Uh, well, let's read verse 30. This whole chapter is good, but I don't want to bore you. Uh, it says in verse 30, they were not estranged from their lust. You see, and that's really where it comes down to is they were covetousness. covetous. They weren't content with what God was giving them. They always wanted more. They always wanted something else. Um, he says, um, while the meat was still in their mouths, I think I mentioned this Sunday, the wrath of God came upon them, and he slew the fattest of them, and he smote down their chosen men. For all this they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. Um, in verse 40, he says, How often did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? It says, Yea, they turned back, they tempted God, and they limited the Holy One of Israel. How many times do we limit God in our prayers? We limit him. We don't, we don't truly just let go and see just how awesome God can be. How grand God can do things. How magnificent that God can provide. We limit God and we put him in a box and we, we think this is how God's going to have to move. And that, that's what I did when I expected that big foundation to give that big grant I limited on how God could work. I, I believe he could do a big miracle and make this one person give a ton of money. But I limited to, to see how he could literally sit back and orchestrate an entire co uh, community and men and people and lay it on the hearts of people. You just come and give. out of the Unsaved men who did not know God, yet they came with a heart to just want to give. Uh, one of the electricians, and I told you I'd stop in a minute, but one of the electricians that did some of the work there, I don't know if he's even still alive, I don't know where he's at, but he fought in Vietnam. And the man cussed like an absolute sailor. I mean, every other word was, oh, I mean, he had taken profanity to an art, and it was at a whole new level. And he knew it was a Christian youth center, he knew we were all Christians, it didn't matter. He just... Cuss like a sailor. But he had bit, fought in the Vietnam War. He was a prisoner of war for I don't know how, how long, a POW. He had, would sit there and tell stories while he's working on, a, on the electrical wiring and just rattle off all these stories of when he was in the war. When he got rescued from the, the camp, uh, he was 100 pounds. It was all the more he weighed um, because of being tortured uh, while he was uh, a prisoner of war during the Vietnam. Um, and it was right around the time that that huge tsunami, remember that humongous, I don't know what year that was, but that humongous tsunami came and just wiped out 
was it Thailand? I don't know where it was, but uh, wiped out that that region of areas. And he said that he sent, and I believe, I mean, you might when I say this, you might think uh, that he he was exaggerating. I don't think he was. I think he was telling the truth. He said he mailed in the mail to the relief fund that they were doing to try to help all those all those people. He withdrew $100,000 out of his savings to go help all of those people. And this is an unsaved man who, and he even said, and he used a whole bunch of colorful words when he said it, but he said, those people torture me beyond my, my comprehension. And he says, and here I am sending them $100,000 to help them. And if, an un, if God brought an unsaved man and I don't know, I, I've told that story before, so God used him to, to help me because it, it touched my heart to think about it. But he was also given the gospel, I don't know how many times, as he was working away, he was hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ being spoken. God orchestrated in a wilderness all of these things. And that's how God works. He's able to do that. But if he would have just had some big fancy company give a huge, write out a big old check and then we just pay it all in full, all of those things, all of those stories, all of those times of praying, God, I'm waiting to see your hand and then to see God's hand move, I, we would have lost those, those experiences. So that time in the wilderness, it's never fun because it's a dry and it's a thirsty place. But you see, God is able to provide water in the wilderness. God is able to set a table for us in the presence of even our enemies, David said in Psalms 23. God is able to do it. And see, in the wilderness is the only place that our faith gets tested. To will, what, what are we really made of? Will we really truly surrender to God and trust Him to make a way? Or are we going to complain that it isn't the way we want it to be? The church in the wilderness, uh, I don't want to limit God. I want God to be, be able to show forth his mighty hand in everything that, that he wants to do. And I just want to be obedient. And I want at the end of all of this life, when I stand before the Lord, uh, I want to be able to know and to hear that I didn't doubt God. And I trusted in him I, I can tell you now, in my way of thinking, there's good, there's shame, because I know what I've thought in the past. I know of the doubt that I've had. I know, I know the times that I've cried out to God and said, where are you, Lord? Um, but God has always been faithful to me, and I want to trust him. I want to see God, God move. Anybody have anything you want to share? Anything that's...